Vernon Baptist Church, I'm glad you guys are here. Thank you, praise team, for leading us in worship. Um, I'll make sure to get the note back to Alan that you guys did an okay job and that uh, y'all be praying for him. Sorry, Ethan. <laughs> Ethan turned around. Just keep going. It's okay. Uh, uh, y'all be praying for him. Who in their right mind decides to go to Yellowstone with four, three kids under the age of six? I mean, uh, you would go. All right. Well, anyways, but I hear they're doing great. They're having fun. Uh, apparently, Wes was playing with a bear, right? Wanted to anyways. <laughs> but anyways, but just be praying for Alan that he can get some refreshment and uh, can come back ready to go and lead us here uh, as our worship pastor. So, but uh, thank you guys on turn for being here. I know... Uh, Pray for, we're going to pray for a lot of uh, churches and uh, stuff. I have a lot of brothers in ministry this morning that are not able to have church. Um, they're doing other means and stuff, but they're all struggling with some things right now. So we'll be lifting them up. And I know we got a lot here that are sick. So let's be lifting them up in prayer as well. And then for those that are traveling, we're not going to pray for them. Uh, I'm just kidding, kidding, kidding joke. But uh, I'm glad you guys are here. It's been a while since I've got to get up here behind the pulpit. It's been I think about five months, I guess, since the last time I've got to stand here. Uh, a lot of people were asking me when was the next time I was going to roll, and I was like, I don't know. I'm waiting on Brother Nath. So if you ever need a referral, just go straight to Brother Nath, and then he'll come to me. But it's been about five months, but I have learned this, and I think I'm doing okay with it today. I have got to learn to control my excitement. Um, apparently last week, Bob, you'll love to hear this, I got a new nickname, and when, I did, when, when, when it was going on last week, I didn't really know how excited I was, apparently, but apparently a lot of you people saw some excitement in me in the way I was baptizing last week. Uh, I am now called the Slammer. So uh, it was like people would come up, and, and for the baptism, I'm like, have you accepted Jesus Christ? And they're like, yes. Then it is my honor, you know, and then I'm just like, slam, in the water you go. Like I drove some people down. And I didn't really think I was doing that. Uh, until I went back and watched the video of the young girl, Miss Ava. When I dumped her, her feet come flying up. So I was like, okay, they might have a point there. Uh, and then the next, and then Wednesday night, I was sitting there, and Mariah comes up to me, and she said, Mr. Mike, I thought she was going to take me to the bottom of that tank. <laughs> Sorry, Mariah. But anyways, I was like, apparently I was excited, but Brandon, I was nice and fluffy with you, right? I mean, we was calm and cool, so... I mean, so I was really excited last week. And y'all, here's where it's at. Here's how you know that you've achieved something in life is when Roger Meadows makes fun of you. Okay? So at Life Group the other night, and he's like, Mike, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm fine. Why? He's like, you sure? I'm like, yes, sir. He's like, well, what was this? Push! <laughs> he said, you were slamming them, son. I was like, I'm so sorry. I've achieved the pinnacle now. I'm now Pharaoh the Great Slammer. But anyways, so I've got to learn to control my excitement. I get it. I'm not nervous. I'm not scared. I'm just really excited. Uh, so, I mean, when God was moving in the hearts of four people last week, I mean, how could you not be excited? So it was a great, week, great time last week. So I'm sorry if I hurt anybody. And don't be scared to come to me if you want to get baptized. I mean, I can work on it, I guess. But anyways, so let me take a deep breath here. Let me get my emotions under control. Let me read my little saying here from God. And away we'll go. Today, we're going to be looking at Psalm 139. Um, I'm sure that if you've been raised in church or been around church long enough in your life, you've heard some really great sermons on Psalm 139. Today won't be one of those. But anyways, I'm sure you've heard them. And for me, when I first, when Nate told me this, that I'd get this opportunity, God immediately carried me to Psalm 139, and he was like, this is what I want you to preach. And I was like, I was thinking about it, and it was on my heart, and I was like, "There's, but I've already preached Psalm 139. And so I went back through my notes and looking at all my sermons and stuff, and I never could find where I preached on Psalm 139. But I did find this out. I have referenced this psalm multiple, multiple times. And so I guess that's why it felt like I'd already preached it, because it's so much good stuff in here. There's so much... Uh, meat on this verse here that I, was, I just kept pulling from it and adding to other sermons. And so I guess it's kind of fitting that today that I have this opportunity to preach on Psalm 139. So why a sermon on Psalm 139? Because I want to be known as, and I'm following the lead of Nath, I want to be known as an applicational preacher. Messages that you can hear 
the Word of God that you can open up, take it, apply it to your life, and, 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 and serve the kingdom of God. And so I was like, why do a, a message on Psalm 139? Well, it answers the two main questions that the world is searching for today. Who am I? And why am I here? And if you don't get those two questions answered the right way, that is what leads to a lot of problems and stuff that go on in this world. Um, I've learned in counseling and ministry that when I talk to people and I minister to them and, and, I, and they get mad or they get upset, I've come to learn that they was never really mad at me or mad at anything. It was just something going on in their life that they were mad about, and I was just there. It's kind of like with Darren. I'm not always mad at Darren. It's just sometimes something that goes on, I take it out on her. But it all rolls back to these two base, basic questions. Who am I and why am I here? That's what sent me on my journey of faith. That's what moved me in 10 years from the, the pew to the pulpit. That's what God started on with me was who am, I, who am I and why am I here? And the world's answers to those questions are, you tell me if I'm right or wrong after service, but the world's answers to who I am, who am I, is be whoever you want to be as long as it makes you happy. In other words, your joy, your happiness is going to be wrapped up in situations and circumstances that you're in. Your happiness and your joy is going to be wrapped up in how you identify inside the world. But it didn't stop there. Because suicide and panic and depression and anxiety is on an all-time high, they just rebranded it and they relabeled it to be whoever you want to be. They changed from be whoever you want to be to be whatever you want to be, as long as it makes you happy. Same wording, just different brand, but the same results. Who am I, by the world standard, is just wrapping your identity up in what's going on in your life. The world's answer to why I'm here. The world says that you are just a biological existence and your only goal is to survive while you are here. Shakespeare wrote, all the world's a stage and all the men and women, well, they're just merely players. They have their entrances and their exits. Atheistic, naturalist, naturalistic explanation is that there's no higher reason that you are here. That you are here just to take up space, and while you're here, that you were just created um, by accident, and that you should just eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you are going to die. That's the purpose what the world says you are here for. But Psalm 139 teaches me at least, and I hope today it comes out to y'all, that it teaches y'all that there's someone or something that knows who you are truly and truly knows why you are here. And God knows. God knows who you are. God knows why you're here. And that's our opening question. Well, what does God know? What does God know? God knows you who you are. God knows why you're here. So today we're going to be looking at Psalm 139. I'm going to start in verse 1. I'm going to read down to 16. So if you have your word, you can look with me. It says, verse 1, O Lord, you have searched me and you have known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and you're acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is just too wonderful for me. It is too high, and I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall, where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed and shoal, you're there as well. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be, be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. For darkness is as light with you, for you form my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, 
You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Pray with me. So, Father God, as we come to this scripture today, God, God, you've searched me and you know me. God, I pray for the individual today that, uh, that's struggling to know who they are. God, that's struggling to know why they're here. Because a lot right now, a lot doesn't make sense. So, Father, I pray that through your word today, God, that we can leave this place knowing that you know everything. And, God, that since you know everything, you know what's best for me, know what's best for us. So, Father, I just lift up whoever today is struggling, God. Just work, God. Work through your word, God. Let this be something that they can hear. But don't just leave here, God. Let them start to apply this to their life, and they leave here changed. And that, God, that they understand that their purpose here is not to just take up space, but to actually glorify you. And so, Father, I give you this word. I give you this message. I give you this time. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. First point, God knows your heart. So what does God know? God knows your heart. Psalm 139, verse 1 starts with, O Lord, you have searched me and you have known me. I said this in the youth group the other night because we're in the middle of this series of being known by God. And I said that and was like, well, how does that make you feel to know that God has searched you and God knows you? And they were like, ooh. Ooh. It's kind of awkward. It's kind of weird. It's kind of scary. Because some of them, and I'm hoping that there's someone in here, I know there's someone in here that's never read that verse, but to them to really know that the God of the universe, the maker of all things, can look down inside them, can search them and know them, it kind of made some of them for the first time hearing it like, whoa. It scared them. And got a little awkward. It's like, what in the world? I mean, I mean, because here's the thing. Some of us think that we can hide things from God, adults as well. See, we want to forget, we choose to forget that God is omniscient. Omniscient meaning all-knowing. And David starts it out right there in verse 4, and he says, O Lord, you have searched me. O Lord, you have known me. But he didn't stop there. In verse, 10, he, uh, verse 2, he says, You know me when I sit down and when I rise up. God knows your schedule, folks. He knows what you have on your daily to-do list. So I'm going to have him give you a warning. There is no excuse for you to say why you can't spend time with the Lord. Because God knows when you rise. God knows when you sit down. God knows your schedule. Continuing in 2, he says, You discern my thoughts from afar. Now this one's really scary. You know my thoughts. Anybody want to shrink down in your chair a little bit right now? God knows your thoughts. Verse 3 he says, You searched out my path and my lying down, and you're acquainted with all my ways. God knows the journey that you're on. God knows the situation you're in. God knows the circumstances you're in right now. God knows it all. And then verse 4 he says, Even before a word is on my tongue, God, you know. God knows that thing that you're about to say to that person. God knows that thing that you're about to think about saying to that person God knows everything and this isn't in the verse but he even knows the number of hairs on your head for some of you if you're struggling with that I can give you that answer zero God knows God knows everything and he finishes up there in verse 4 he says behold O Lord you know it all together anybody ready to repent now should we go straight into invitation God knows everything and everyone and every point in eternity. Just know that about my God. So, but what if, and here's the thing, you know, we looked at Psalm 139 as this scary verse, like, whoa. But what if, and here's where I want to take you today. What if Psalm 139 was never really written to scare you? What if Psalm 139 was written to show you something different about relationships? 
Now, I will say Psalm 139 should be that warning line, that warning signal that goes off in our head about when we're about to do something that we know we shouldn't be doing. Psalm 139 should be that little thing that starts clicking like, don't do that, don't say that, don't think that. I agree that, that that's what it could be used for because we're really not deceiving God. Um, you can try, and some of us have tried, some amazing men of God have tried, some people in the Bible have tried, Adam and Eve even tried to in Genesis 3 uh, when they ate the fruit and then they tried to hide from God and they tried to hide what they had done and then God comes walking in the cool of the breeze and says, where are you? I've preached on that one. And uh, Adam comes out and he shifts the blame over to who, ladies? Eve, yeah, the wife. But then... He even shifts the blame over to God. He says, you know, it's, it's Eve that did it, you know, the one that you made for me. So really it's not even Eve's fault, it's your fault. Even though in his heart, he desired it. He wanted it. He wasn't deceiving God. But Cain tried as well, didn't he, in Genesis 4 when he killed his brother? And he tried to act like, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what happened to my brother. Am I my brother's keeper? even though in his heart he knew what he had done. And then you, we're going to talk about the heart. What about the man after God's own heart, David? In Second Samuel, with the story of Bathsheba, when he's up on top of the balcony or the palace walking around, when he shouldn't have been there in the first place, he should have been with his men in battle, but he's up there walking around, and he sees a beautiful woman. He desired her. He wanted her. That desire turned into a relation. That relation turned into a pregnancy. Uh, and then to cover it up or to deceive everyone, to, to hide it from people, he, you know, come up with this plan to get Uriah, her husband, get, her, get him up to the gates, uh, the, the front line of the battle, so he could kill him. That way he could come back, take Bathsheba as his wife and marry her and deceive everyone. But the prophet Nathan come. He didn't deceive God, even though he knew in his heart what he had done. See, all of these people, and we've probably come to this point in our life, we can't deceive God because God knows. So what if Psalm 139 was never really written to scare, scare us, but it was written us to show how intimately God loves us? What if it was written to show us uh, just how amazingly close he wants to be to, with you in your life? He wants to be close with you because it's absurd to think we can hide anything. It's absurd to think we can deceive God. God says, I read you and I've actually can still read you like an open large print book. So why do you try and hide? Why do you try and uh, push me back and try and deceive me? I'll tell you why. Closeness terrifies some of us. God wants an intimate relationship with his creation. But being that close to something terrifies us. It's like that, uh, it's like the old girly movies. Like, by the way, I love chick flicks, girl flicks, you know, you know, notebook, all that good stuff. So I'm not making fun of this at all. But it's at that point where the rain's coming down and the man and the woman, they're sitting there. And, and he's like, why are you, what are you so scared of? You know you love me. Just tell me. Just show me what you want. And the woman, she's just like, I don't know. I'm so afraid. And you're sitting there on your couch and you're crying and spilling your popcorn and you're screaming, just tell her you love her so I can see how this plays out. Why doesn't she want to tell him how much she loves him? It's because she's afraid he'll hurt her. She's afraid of letting him get that close to her. Psalm 139 was written to tell us we don't have to be afraid, church. We don't have to be afraid to let God know us and let God search us and let God see us, everything about us, because he loves us and he knows our heart. See, the world, when they look at us, they see us from the outside, but God sees straight to the heart. First Samuel 16, 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on the appearance or on the height of his stature, because I rejected him. Ready? For the Lord sees not as man does. Man looks on the outward, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so if you're sitting there, you're like, Okay, Mike, God sees my heart. God knows my heart. Well, then does God know about the sin in my heart? Yes, he does. 
Because there have been times I've really struggled in my sin and I've fallen at this altar and I've asked God, God, how in the world can you still love me knowing what I've done? Not even how can you still love me. Like, God, I want to know why you still love me. And for me as a pastor, I'm like, are you even really sure I'm worthy of this calling on my life? Because I'm broken. And then I read verses like Jeremiah 1, five. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And I read that verse and I'm just like, my gosh. And then you look at the cross. Jesus knew the sins of the world. He knew every one of them, and he took every one of them upon himself. And yet he still chose to die for us. He still chose to die for you. He still chose to die for me. He just didn't pick certain sins. He knew all sins. So God is not surprised by your sin. He loves you despite your sin. Now, I'm not saying since God knows about your sin that it's okay to keep on going and sinning. The Bible says that no one who abides in him will keep on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. If you can sin and be okay with it, I need to, you to check your salvation. Because I know when I sin and when I struggle, there's something on me that just consumes who I am. I believe I've preached this before, that that conviction that God is laying on my heart when my ears are burning and I just feel so heavy, I believe that's a sign of my salvation That because I remember there was a point in my life I could do some things and I would not care. But there's something different in my heart and that's Jesus and when, when I sin and do things, I struggle so badly and for so long I let that sin and I let the weight of that just bring me down to where I could not be used by God. And I found Psalm 139. And I read, He isn't mad at us. He's madly in love with us. Church, God knows your heart because He created your heart. Second thing that God knows is God knows your identity. Now, before some of you turn off your ears or get up on the edge of your seat thinking I'm about to go somewhere, we're going to look at how God knows a false identity about us and a true identity about us. And I believe when we can answer those questions, then we can start about the worldly issues of identity. But God knows the false one that we're portraying to the world, but he also knows the true one that he's called us to be. Psalm 139, 515, just to give you a reminder that God knows all things, it says, You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge, well, that's just too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in shoal, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. Verse 11, if I say... Surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be by night. But even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for the darkness is as light with you. So once again, you can see God sees, God knows. You cannot hide anything from him, yet we still try. God knows who we are, but, the, but we have this worldly uh, talent where we create this perfect false identity. See, we can fool people, but we can never fool God. See, we have searched out. This is something I was having fun with the youth the other day. We have searched out and we have edited the perfect face file, Facebook profile picture, haven't we? That picture that represents you on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. How much time went into making that picture to make it look a certain way? I mean, some of you are looking at it and you're like, okay, the angle's right on that one. Like, Cody, if he ever takes pictures of you, he'll get on the ground and take photos. Like, that was a joke for Cody. But anyways, the perfect angle, you searched it out. You was looking at it, he's like, man, that looks okay. I like that one. I'm going to post this one. But you just didn't stop at the angle. The, angle. Uh, the lighting, right? The lighting was perfect. It was more of a sunrise or a sunset. 
And then you look so cute in your little outfits. And that background, right? You've got to have the perfect background where you're posing at Real Foot Lake and you're like, mm, now I want some boyettes. But everything about that photo is perfect. Because you're just not going to get up in the morning and take a photo and put that as your profile picture, are you? Some of the youth said they did that. I was like, I, I don't see that because if you get up looking like that every day, wow, well, goodness, all right. But so they put so much work into that photo. But I got to ask you, and I asked them, does that photo really reflect who you are and how you feel? Is your life that perfect? For some of us, no. But we have this ability to create this false identity and create these things. Here we go with this word that's very hot right now. Create these masks. And I thought it was funny, and as I was preparing for this sermon, some of us get so torn up and so divided, oh, mask versus no mask, when some of us have been wearing masks for a long, long time. See, we, ma we wear these masks to hide who we really are and how we really feel. And when we walk around and, and, and we, we, our response is sometimes, it's the greatest lie I ever told, I think, in some aspects, is when somebody's like, how are you doing today? And you're like, I'm fine, knowing you're not. And let me go ahead and give you a side note, and I was talking to the youth about this. If you have a, a, a struggle on you need to know who your true friends are and your false friends are, um, your true friend will see when you're struggling. They'll know. They'll know something's not right with you. So many times in this church, I'll walk around with my mask on, trying to keep rolling, keep doing things, and people will pull up to me, pull me to the side and say, hey, how are you, Mike? And I'm like, ready? put my mask on I'm fine and they're like no you're not are you okay you're not yourself so a true friend will see right through your mask but that's a whole nother message but we get to this thing guys we get this skill to us this creating this mask now what's the danger of this mask is that we get comfortable in those masks we find our identity in those masks we allow this false identity to begin to rule our lives and our identity and who we are well it gets becomes wrapped up in this superficial and shallow and temporary things our identity gets wrapped up in these worldly paws of life right Pauls positions we get our identity is wrapped up in our positions it's where I stand in the community how popular I am the achievements I've reached at work I am valuable because I am an elite person you got your positions, but then you also got your appearances, your attractiveness, your good hair. I got a haircut this week. Your body. I ate a Twinkie. It's not good. But you get value by how you look. I get it. I understand it. When you walk into a room, you want to hear compliments and you want attention. But your value is being wrapped up in your identity, which is false. So you have your positions, your appearance. You also have your wealth, right? Uh, how much money you have, the car you drive, the version of iPhone or Android you personally, uh, you, you now have, how big your house is, how big your lake house is. Uh, your value gets wrapped up in the stuff that you have. Your identity gets wrapped up in the stuff that you have. Position, appearance, wealth. Then you have your skills, how talented you are, how smart you are, how athletic you are. We all have certain things that let define us on how worthy we are in our identity. So what's the danger in those things, celebrating those things? Absolutely nothing. There's no danger. In, I'm not saying don't celebrate having nice hair. I'm not saying don't celebrate great standings. What I'm saying is if you're allowing those things to define your value, what happens when they're down? What happens when it's not going so well? For example, today one guy, you might be saying, I got a promotion at work. I feel great. I am rolling. And then the next day you come in, you're in your wife's lap saying, I've lost my job. What is your value now? It's gone. Or talking about the appearance and you, you're talking about the haircut, like, man, I feel good today, right? I feel so good this morning. I got up and I was like, man, that nice haircut, I need to get rid of all that fuzziness on my face. So I shaved all that off. I got my white shirt on. Darren wouldn't let me wear the white shoes today. She said I'm preaching. But anyways, I was like, man, I look good. I feel great. I'm just, man, I'm valuable. And then I think about a moment a few years ago. I asked, by the way, gentlemen, never ask your wife to cut your hair when they wake up. 
So I said, I get there and got up and I said, hey, can you trim my neck a little bit? And she got up and she was barely asleep. And she took the clippers and she went, Zhing! it was straight no guard. So I had a two inch wide mo reverse mohawk come up the back of my head. And I'm like, what have you done? I was like, now I got to wear a hat. I'm going to look stupid. People are going to make fun of me. I don't feel valuable. So the danger is, folks, is that when we start to spend most of our life, right? That's what we're doing. Spending most of our days chasing after these worldly things to feel valuable, to find our true identity. When we do that, we get so caught up in the superficial that we will never feel worthy. And we live in a culture that puts value on every one of those Pauls I just talked about. We live in a culture that says your position, your appearance, your wealth, your skills, every one of those things says who you are and they add value to your life and that is your identity. That is not who you are. That is your false identity. Because temporary identity will always give you temporary value. Those things are temporary. And so let's move over to the true identity. Verse four, uh, 13 of Psalm 139 says, For you have formed my inward parts. You have knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret. And I try my best with the youth group to tell them that God knows what he's doing when he made you. See, God knows our real identity. God knows our real value comes from one thing, guys. One thing only is that you are a child of the king. That is your identity. For those who have given your life to Christ, God looks through that false identity. And I'm sure he's sitting there saying, why are you trying so hard to be who you're not designed to be? You are a child of the king. He looks at each and every one of you and says, that is my precious son. That is my precious daughter. You don't have to earn his love. You didn't have to earn your value. You are a child of the king, and that is who you are, and that is your identity. 1 John 3, 1 says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. And the reason why the world does not know us is, is that it did not know Him. See, the world doesn't understand this, you're a child of the King. They don't get all of that. They don't understand that because they've never felt the love. They've never felt the value. They've never felt the presence of God that consumes them to the point where they don't walk around putting on masks. God says the reason the world doesn't know them is He didn't know me because if you know me, you'll know your true identity. If he knows my heart and he knows my identity, then why do I struggle so much? Why do I feel so unworthy? Well, I think the answer to that is you just need to get back to a place of remembering. Remembering the fact that Jesus Christ willingly gave his life for you. Back to the place where the valuable, the, the, you're so valuable that the king of the universe, he came on this earth, spent 30 years praying and fasting, enduring temptations. He uh, endured mockery. He was beaten. He was spit on. He was beat. You know, we, it just makes you mad knowing about all that. To the point where he was ultimately killed. All because he loved you and he saw value in you. He did not die because of your position. He did not die because of your appearance. He did not die because of how much money and wealth you have. He did not die because of the skills that you have. He died because you're his child. See, we have value in Christ, not because of what we've done, but what Christ has done for us. It's nothing but the blood, folks. A lot of pulpits and stuff will preach a certain thing a certain way, and that's, that's for them, but I just want everyone to know it's nothing but the blood of Jesus. But God still knows that we wrap up our value and our identity. In. And if our identity is wrapped up in anything other than the fact that you're son or daughter of the living God, you are living in a false identity, church. And God wants you to know, Ephesians 2.10, for you are God's masterpiece.
created in Christ Jesus to do the good things he prepared so long ago. So God knows your heart. God knows your identities. And then lastly, God knows your purpose. Why was the dolphin sad? He lost his porpoise in life. You guys didn't think it was funny. That side did. It's, it's, it's a heavy message today. God knows your heart. God knows your identity. It's really heavy. And so I was like, that's a funny joke. I don't know if I can say porpoise right. But anyways, why was the dolphin sad? He lost his porpoise in life. Ha, ha, ha. Moving on. So why am I here? God knows who you are, but he also knows why you are. Because here's the thing. Identity can never be separated from its purpose. Identity cannot be separated from its purpose. Psalm 139, 16 says, You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before one single day had passed. God knew us. God knew who we would be. God knew our identity. God knew our body before it was formed. And his plan and his purpose were already formed for us. In fact, if you think about it, your purpose in this life was formed before your body ever was. Your purpose in life was formed before your body ever was. See, the world can try and tell you what your purpose is, but it can't. You could go to bookstores, you could go online, you could go to Amazon, you can go wherever you want and find these books about purpose in life. And you, you can look for them and try and figure it out. But here's the thing, you're only buying someone's opinion. So you can't, the world can't tell you what your purpose is. Think about it this way. Anybody ever been to Cracker Barrel? That's a yes. Yeah, chicken and dumplings. Can I go there today? Um, anyone ever sat down at the tables at Cracker Barrel and looked up on the walls and, and saw all those things that they have hanging up? And has anyone ever asked, I wonder what that is? I wonder what that was made for? Only the creator of that can tell you what the purpose was for it. The one that created that, he could tell you the material that it was made for, out of. He could tell you why it's shaped a certain way. He could tell you what it's going to do. He could tell you everything about it. He can tell you the purpose of that crazy contraption setting up on the wall of Cracker Barrel. So why do we search everywhere else for purpose when we should be going to the one that created us? See, God knows what he made. God created you. God knows your purpose. He knows why you're here. Um, because, you know, only the creator can know the purpose. And so if we're here today and we're struggling to know what our purpose is, it's very clear in Romans 11:36. It says, listen to these words, church, if you're looking for purpose. For from him and through him, and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. You're here. Your purpose is to glorify God in all things you do. St. Augustine said, man was made for God, but he never found rest until he found the one who created him. That is our purpose, to share the glory of God, to bring Him glory. That is the shared purpose of every single body in this place today, is to glorify God wherever you are, wherever He's called you. If it's in a hospital, if it's in a factory, if it's in a, a Fulcum Lanham, if it's, it's wherever, your purpose is to glorify God. The world will try and say, well, that's not that important. That is very much important, and we're living in the results of it right now, where people have forgotten what they're here for, what they're created for, to glorify God. We think we're here now to live for self. We're here to live for Him. And the world needs to see that. The world needs to hear that. Some of you might be saying, duh, I knew that, Mike. I knew that was my purpose. But did you know that when you know the purpose, you can begin to understand the plan? Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know, whoo, there's that word again, no. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. 
Because a plan, we get confused. A plan is different than a purpose. We all have the same exact purpose in this room to glorify and honor God, but each of us have a different plan on how we do that. That's back to the teachers and the lawyers and the doctors and the factory workers and wherever you're called in life. That is the plan that God is using you. The problem is, are you being used by God in those positions? problem is is that many of us in here we're just afraid we're terrified one to let him get that close to us and we're afraid to step out on what he's called us to do i get it i understand that you think you're afraid because you think god doesn't know you think god will abandon you in that moment you think God might let you fail at that to grow you a little bit. But here's the thing. God actually wants each and every one of you to succeed even more than you want to. Because if God guides, God provides. If God guides, then God will provide. Why would he do that? It's because he knows your heart. It's because he knows your true identity and he knows your purpose in this world don't let the world take that away from you in closing it says what does God know everything so the lesson to learn then if God knows everything there is no need to hide and the application is, does God have your heart? Because that is where it starts. So if you're sitting here today and you're struggling with it and you're like, you know, uh, you're hearing something for the first time. God knows me, goes my heart, he knows my identity, he knows my purpose, he knows everything about me. But it comes back to the point, if you're not living out for him, it starts with, does God know, does God have your heart? Because... We're going to go into an invitation here in a minute, and the praise team can come on up as we, we get ready to close this. But Psalm 139 begins with, O oh Lord, you have searched me and you've known me. But have you ever read it all the way through and look how it ends? Psalm 139, 23 says this. David, at the beginning, was talking about God. Oh, you searched me, and God, you've known me. You know all this about it. It's like I can feel the passion of David getting there toward the end of his song, the psalm. He's sitting there and he's thinking about it. And, and I bet it's not in the quiet little tone of voice that he says, Psalm 23. And I'm not trying to add the scripture here. I'm just, I just, for me, it's like, it has an exclamation point. But it says, David gets to this point where he's walking up to God and he says, Search me. Search me, God. Anybody want to stand up right now and tell God to search them? But once you know your identity, once he knows your heart, once he knows your purpose, you can only stand up for one day. And if you're living for God, you get to this point where you come up to God and you say, Search me, God. Know my heart, God. And if there's anything wrong in my heart, God, remove it so that I may better serve you, that I may be 